Theodosius III ruled from 715 to 717, the middle of what we call the Byzantine Dark Ages, a period for which we have very little literary evidence. And he stands out for a few reasons. One is that he had no desire for power, either to claim it in the first place or to reclaim it once he lost it. Second is that pretty much everything that he ever achieved happened after he left office. So how can that be? Also, how did he end up living so long after he was deposed from the throne? Very few people have that happen. For obvious reasons, new emperors are usually eager to eliminate their fallen foes. But in the case of Theodosius III, he genuinely had no interest in being emperor, and his successors recognized that. So let's look at Theodosius III, who we can sort of call something like the Jimmy Carter of Byzantine emperors. As is so often the case when it comes to Byzantine emperors who lived during the Byzantine Dark Ages, we don't know a lot about Theodosius's origins or his personal life. What we do know is that he was a tax collector in the southern part of the Obsequian theme in 717 when the thematic army decided to make him emperor. Aside from that, all else is largely speculative. The nature of the speculation at this point, however, is that he either was an illegitimate son of Tiberius III, who ruled from 698 to 705, or that he was just some guy who had made it big somehow as a tax collector, and he held from fairly humble birth. Either way, it doesn't really make a lot of difference. For whatever reason, he was selected and he became an emperor. Roman and Byzantine history is replete with examples of men begging the troops not to elevate them to the purple, but perhaps no one was quite as reluctant as Theodosius III. When he was chosen by the Obsequian army, he literally went and hid in a nearby forest and the soldiers had to spend hours trying to find him, but eventually they did find him and they were still determined that he was going to be their emperor so they didn't give him a choice and in May of 715 he was elevated to the purple against his will. When Theodosius and his men came knocking Anastasius II was not eager to give up power. He too after all had been elevated by the men of the Obsequian theme. After six months Anastasius II was forced to flee Constantinople and it fell to Theodosius III. And this is where the Patriarch Germanus proved his worth and his loyalty to the emperor who appointed him, Anastasius II. He arranged an intervention which convinced Theodosius to allow Anastasius to retire to a monastery, um, and all Anastasius had to do was recognize Theodosius' authority. Anastasius was neither mutilated nor blinded. So now Theodosius is on the throne, and he has a reputation for mercy, which is both a good and a bad thing. It's good in the sense that he is not seen as a bloody usurper, but it's bad in the sense that some of his enemies won't really hesitate to revolt against him since he now has a reputation for being a bit soft. It can never be overemphasized that Theodosius III ruled during the middle of the Byzantine Dark Ages. He ruled for 15 to 16 months, and we don't really know all that much about his time and power. One thing that we do know is that he faced a major crisis when the Arabs invaded by land and sea in 716. This invasion was fairly comparable to the invasion that Anastasius II had faced just a couple years before. Now, when Theodosius looked at his options, he decided that the best approach to this problem would be to gain additional military support from the Bulgars. So he made a peace treaty with Turval the Bulgar which was favorable to Bulgar interest in order to gain military aid against the Arabs. It is possible that this policy ended up hurting his legitimacy in the eyes of many of his generals, but this proved to be a wise policy in 719 when his successor was able to call upon Bulgar aid and successfully relieve the capital from a siege. Anastasius II had once ordered an invasion of Syria which was going to be led by Leo the Asarian. In 717, Leo the Asarian is still the strategos of the Anatolic theme and he is one of the most well-regarded generals in the Byzantine service. When he looks at Theodosius III, he sees an opportunity to make his own bid for power. So 
In conjunction with the Stratagos of the Armeniac theme, he launches a revolt in early 717. And his bid for the throne is made much easier by the fact that he happened to capture Theodosius' son in the city of Nicomedia early on. So, on March 25, 717, Theodosius III abdicated in favor of Leo III once they reached an agreement where Theodosius III would be allowed to live out his life in peace and his son would be released unharmed. The circumstances by which Theodosius III left power were every bit as interesting as the circumstances by which he had been elevated to it in the first place. And his post-imperial career is also pretty interesting. So Theodosius and his son, who confusingly is also named Theodosius, both entered the clergy in 717 as part of their agreement with Leo III. And in 729, either the father or the son, most likely the son, became the bishop of Ephesus. And the reason we think it was probably the son is because this bishop Theodosius is referenced as still being alive in 754 and attending the Council of Hyria which uh, would have made Theodosius III quite old by that point, so it almost certainly was his son who became a bishop. But it's still interesting to think about how Theodosius III sacrificed his career as emperor in order to save his son, and then how his son went on to become a leading bishop of one of the major cities in the Byzantine Empire. So, in that regard, I would say that Theodosius III is kind of an interesting fellow in that he actually put his own family ahead of his personal interest and his quest for power. And in that way, he's actually somewhat admirable. <laughs>